Hello, and welcome to AJC's Virtual Global Forum. Thank you for joining us. My name is Bobby Barouche, and I'm the second generation of my family to be involved in the work of AJC. My mother became engaged in the 1960s around AJC's work on discrimination and glass ceilings in the corner offices of American business. Decades later, my parents helped create AJC's Transatlantic Institute in Brussels, and I'm proud to continue their work by serving on the TAI board today. My personal passion is interreligious and intergroup work, and I'm honored to chair AJC's interreligious efforts and to serve on AJC's Executive Council in that capacity. In today's program, you'll see AJC's deep commitment to restoring America. Drawing on over a century of experience, AJC works every day to strengthen the fabric of intergroup and interreligious relations and to restore the American center by seeking bipartisan consensus. Though our beloved country has faced challenging times in recent years, by reimagining what's possible, we know we can help restore the promise of America for all. If you'd like to join us in this vital work, please visit AJC.org. Thank you for being with us today. Enjoy the program. My name is Arun Vishwanath. Although I grew up in a conventional and somewhat insular modern Orthodox community in Teaneck, New Jersey, and attended Jewish day schools in the area, my family background is somewhat atypical. My sisters and I were raised speaking only Yiddish and Tamil at home. My mother was herself raised in a Yiddishist family that has been dedicated for generations to maintaining and promoting the language despite ongoing threats to its continuity and vitality over the course of the 20th century, including the Holocaust and assimilation. My father, on the other hand, who was born in South India and raised in the multilingual metropolis of Bombay, appreciated how much identity is bound up in language, and he too committed to passing along his own native tongue and culture to us. These two languages and the cultures surrounding them defined our home life. Our nightly bedtime was preceded by the singing of Yiddish folk songs. Every Shabbos, we would eat rice, curry, and sambar and recite the Kiddush in Tamil as well as in Hebrew. Our Passover seders featured a lively reenactment of the dialogue of the four sons from the Yiddish language Workman Circle Haggadah. And we would ask the four questions not only in Yiddish, but in Tamil as well. This background admittedly made it a little hard to fit in with the other kids, but it also exposed me to a considerable amount of diversity within and outside the Jewish community that I otherwise would never have encountered. It awakened a curiosity in me about all the different ways that someone can relate to their Jewish identity and build their Jewish practice. It meant interacting and making friends with people from a broad spectrum of religious, communal, and political affiliations within the Yiddish world. It gave me permission to explore and build relationships across various diaspora communities outside of my own, such as the Cochinis and the Bene Israel in India and the geographically dispersed Ladino speaking community. It is precisely my deep pride in my heritage and Jewish practice and my commitment to passing it on to my own children and introducing it to those around me that allows me to appreciate the differences among the individuals and communities that make up American Jewry. Our unity does not require us to be the same. In fact, our passion for our own communities, identities, and heritage needn't close us off to each other, but can rather give us the ability to recognize and appreciate this passion in others and to create opportunities to share, learn, and come together. I am a proud American Jew. Hi everyone, my name is Natalia Mahmoud and I'm the program director of the Muslim Jewish Advisory Council, MJAC. 
and we are today celebrating five years of the Council, which was co-founded by the American Jewish Committee and the Islamic Society of North America. MJAC is a civil society coalition advocating on, on issues of common concern to both the Muslims and the Jewish communities in America. And we're joined today by the co-chairs of the National Council, Stan Bergman and Farooq Katwari. Farooq, before we get to celebrating MJAC's five years and its existence, let's go, let's take a step back and go back to the time when you received the phone call to join um, the council and co-chair the National Muslim Jewish Advisory Council with Stan Bergman. You have a remarkable story of coming to America from Kashmir, and you're now the CEO of Eaton Allen Interiors, this iconic American brand. What was going through your mind as you received that phone call? I'm, I'm very happy to be on this program. And uh, it was an interesting uh, discussion, but I felt comfortable in doing it. I've had an opportunity of interacting on many interfaith areas. I have had an opportunity of uh, co-chairing a task force about 25 years back on the integration of Muslims in America. So it was not something unusual, but of course I had to give it some thought and uh, times are difficult. I run a public company as Stanley Bergman does too. However, I felt it was important for the two communities to work together, to get the message across that end of the day, we need to have much better relations in America. Stan, over to you. You also have an equally amazing story. You're an immigrant from South Africa and you now run, you're now the chairman and CEO of Henry Schein, one of the largest healthcare providers and solutions to medical practitioners and dental companies. And you've also served as the president of AJC. And it was during your time that you um, helped the institution transform in its engagement with the Muslim world. Why is the engagement with the Muslim world important to you? And what was going through your mind as you were looking to MJAC as the vehicle to transform Muslim Jewish relations in America? Well, yeah, um, it's really great to be uh, on this program today with my dear friend Farouk and with you. Look, uh, my parents uh, were refugees from Nazi Germany ended up on the shores of uh, South Africa, where pretty quickly, within a decade, they were introduced to this concept of apartheid. My wife and I left South Africa because we disagreed with the system, and we came to this great country of America, where we saw, of course, great relations between communities. We saw a environment where freedom of speech, freedom of religion was practiced everywhere. However, we quickly discovered that there are race issues in this country. There are so-called prejudice activities relative to different religions. And so it was felt that it was important to reach out to all parts of the American equation, and in that context, an area where relations really needed a lot of building was between the Jewish community and the Muslim community. The idea of tearing down walls of hate starts with building bridges. And so it was natural that MJAC was born in 2016. And when the idea of partnering with a Muslim co-chair was first broached. It became very clear to me, there was one person in the Muslim community that could fill that role perfectly. And that was Farouk Kathrawi. Farouk comes from the British empire, just as I do, and experienced the same educational system as I had and had many, many similar background characteristics. And so we agreed to partner 
to create the first MJAC meeting to establish that together with the professionals of ISNA and AJC. And a key goal was to advocate for the No Hate Act. And that was a key achievement. If you think about it, in 2016, we were dealing with words of hate. 2021, five years later, Congress passed the No Hate Bill Act and it was signed by the president. That was what was in my mind. That was the purpose behind the partnership with Farouk. Picking up what you just said, you know, about the passage of the No Hate Act, you know, this past month, uh, we've, it's been an incredible month for Muslim Jewish relations in terms of not just the passage of bills in Congress uh, here in the United States, but seeing heartbreaking images of the conflict in Gaza and Israel and the news of violence. And as our audience members are sure to note, you know, those um, issues are bound to seep into our conversations here in America. You know, the Muslim Jewish Advisory Council complicates on issues of common concern here in the United States, but of course, conflicts overseas also have an impact and seep into the conversations taking place here. So Stan, I'll turn it back over to you. How do you see the success and the challenges associated with the Muslim Jewish Advisory Council and uh, Muslim Jewish relations in general? Well, Natalia, the first challenge we had to overcome was that of the skeptics in both communities. People saying, wow, there are challenges between Muslims and Jews in the Middle East. How are you gonna to work together in the United States? And of course, what was critical was that this group, MJAC, was bipartisan, strictly bipartisan, and focused on domestic matters. And, uh, you know, we had to overcome stereotypes. I remember walking into a pretty prominent senator's office with Farouk. Somebody, a senator that knew both of us as individuals. And he turned to us and said, what are you both doing here together? So we had to overcome the stereotyping and we had to make sure that we checked our baggage outside the door as it relates to international matters. But quite frankly, there's an expectation that Muslims and Jews are completely on the opposite side. There are many international matters that one would be surprised where I agree with my Muslim brethren and not with my Jewish brethren. This MJAC group is a group that is totally dedicated to making America a better place and to making America a country that delivers on its promises. And so, yes, lots of challenges. We have achieved a lot, but the biggest thing we achieved, bar none, is trust amongst the MJAC members where we can talk about anything. Farouk, what about you? How would you navigate and explain the success and the challenges that are between our two communities? Well, as uh, Stan said, the issue always is who's shaping the debate. If you allow the debate to be shaped by the extremes, you're going to get nowhere. So it was important that persons like Stan, myself and others get together because I believe in most in the world, uh, people want to have peace. They want to live together. And I believe that uh, we, and people like us have to be in the front. If we are not, it's not going to happen. Now, we are both involved with public companies. We have to give a lot of thought, should we be doing it? But on the other hand, if we don't do it, we are really not making the kind of uh, impact we need. So I believe that uh, it's our responsibility to help shape the debate and also have an honest discussion. Look here, as Stan said, there are differences, but we have a lot more in common. And I have, I have learned that I came to this country, you know, as a young student, I was 20 years old from the, these beautiful mountains of Kashmir to beautiful Brooklyn. And I have my first family that I met who took care of me were Jewish. I didn't know they were Jewish. What I found was there were people like everybody else. They had compassion. And when they came to know me, they also felt 
that a person coming from Kashmir, a Muslim, also was really able to live with them, to be one of them. Now, that's important. That message has to get across. Now, as Stan said, there are differences. But we also said we've got to focus on America. Because if we were to focus on all the problems of the world internationally, they're tough, they're challenging. We, are, we will then get off the table and not have a discussion. So I'm glad we are working on it. We are together and we can then understand the differences and try to work how we can overcome them and create the kind of a better relationships between this community and others. And that's what we are trying to do. And, and you've managed to achieve a lot in these past five years, you know, not just with the passage of the No Hate Act, but previously under the previous administration, the passage of the Protecting Religiously Affiliated Institutions Act, you know, workshops with the Department of Justice on protecting houses of worship, calling on Congress to hold hearings on looking into the rise of violent white supremacy ideology. So the council has achieved a lot um, through the leadership of you two. So congratulations on that. But turning over to, you know, going forward, um, you know, Muslim Jewish relations at a particular inflection point and stand from your vantage point, what do you think are the challenges or the things that we should be focused on for the next 10, 15 years going forward? Yeah. We as a country are rapidly becoming a nation of minorities. We're in aggregate the minorities will become the new majority. It is the responsibility of each one of us, everyone in society, to advance the betterment of the society. So it's my goal that Jews and Muslims, like all other minorities, other religions, people of different backgrounds, will all work together to, de to find a way to deal with the, the dehumanization of people from different backgrounds, dealing with hate. We together have a responsibility to figure out how America can deliver on its promises. Opportunity, safety, freedom of speech, freedom of religion for all America, for all Americans. If I look forward 10 years from now, I would like to think that MJAC is playing a key role in making America a better place, working together to deal with the challenges, with the prejudices that exist, and finding a way where all minorities in this country, which in aggregate, we in aggregate will become the majority, are sitting shoulder to shoulder, making America a better place. That would be my vision for 10 years or so out. Farouk, over to you. What would you say are some of the things that Muslims and Jews in America need to focus on going forward? You know, first, uh, as Muslims, we also have to get the message across about Islam. If, if it's important that people understand, I'm asked, I was last week speaking in Houston at, at, at a function, and one of the questions was about my perspectives of Islam. I said, unfortunately, most religions get misunderstood. We were taught very, very simple that, that the word Islam means submission. A Muslim is a person who submits. We submit to God. In fact, a Muslim, <laughs> by starting anything, is supposed to say, in the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. That's what Islam is about, being gracious, merciful. It's our responsibility to get that mess message across to all Muslims and others. And I think it's tremendously important that message get across so that this wrong impression of what Islam is internally by Muslims and others is somehow we can make an impact. And I think that to me is also extremely important. At that point, you know, the council has created a series of videos hoping to shape the debate, as Farouk, you often say, about Jews and Muslims in America being contributing members of society and showing that they're 
that they're integral threads to the American fabric. So I wanna thank you um, for joining us today for this short conversation. Um, the videos that we're talking about are playing on MJAC's Twitter and Facebook feed. And I'm looking forward to checking in with you, you know, five years from now, talking about the 10 year anniversary of MJAC and the, all the work that we've accomplished together. Thank you. It's a pleasure. It's great to be with all of you and especially to partner with Stan. And it's great, Farouk. Uh, we've come far in five years. The number one goal we wanted was to establish trust, and that's clearly in place now. Some say we're a nation divided. Protests are destructive in Berkeley, California. Protesters are clashing. Six million Americans out of work since this started. It's easy to feel afraid about the future. And time and time again, we've seen what fear can turn into. That's why, as Jews and Muslims, we've come together to stop the rise in hate. We are religious. And we are secular. We are liberals. And we are conservatives. We're even a few moderates. We are black, white, brown. We are Americans. We are Americans. We are Americans. Indivisible. And we will continue to join forces. To help this country reconnect. And to renew America's promise. When the social fabric is being torn apart. Our fates give us strength. To unite. As one. An unlikely alliance is A coming together. A new coalition together. of Jews and Muslims are working in solidarity to fight bigotry. That's why we work together as one. To uphold liberty. And justice. Because that's what Americans do. Because that's what Americans do. Because that's what Americans do. We are Jews. We're Muslims. And we are Americans. Shalom. My name is Ava Rigelhout, and I'm so excited to be part of the American Jewish Committee Virtual Global Forum this year. Most of you probably realized upon me saying Shalom that I don't look like the typical American Jewish woman. I was adopted from China at the age of one by my Ashkenazi Jewish New Yorker single mom. She and my godmother traveled to China to adopt me. As a Jewish Chinese transracial neurodiverse adoptee, my identity and story breaks many stereotypes. I've even faced skepticism as to whether or not I'm Jewish. Some may think Asian Americans are other or foreign and definitely not Jewish. But here I am, proof that they are wrong, a proud American Jew. I'm proud to be Jewish because I'm part of an amazing, resilient, international and diverse community with a rich history and beautiful traditions. At Sunday school, I loved learning how to pronounce the Hebrew prayers and singing with others in the synagogue. As a board member at my university's Hillel, I loved helping with Friday Shabbat services, making sure Jewish students and any who wished to join felt welcome and accommodated. Now, most recently, as a speaker with RespectAbility's National Disability Speakers Bureau, I have great opportunities like this one to share my story with all of you. As Jews, we're connected by history, traditions, songs, and my favorite, matzo ball soup recipes. For me, being a Jewish American Chinese adoptee means adding to the intersectionality of this resilient worldwide community. Our diversity makes us stronger. On the high holidays, I think of all the Jews around the world. Maybe we look different, maybe we act different, but maybe we sing different tunes. But our prayers harmonize together supporting each other. In the end, we are one people. I hope we can all embrace the vast diversity of Jews and Jewish families. When someone identifies as Jewish, they are Jewish. I am a proud American Jew. I'm Maggie Fredman, and I'm American Jewish Committee's Deputy Director of Young Leadership. This year, we witnessed the resilience of college students across the country in the face of a global pandemic. 
For Jewish students, campuses continue to foster positive experiences, community building, and meaningful learning. Yet today's Jewish college students are faced with growing challenges, including mounting efforts to boycott or delegitimize Israel, a rising number of anti-Semitic incidents reported on campus, and an increase in anti-Jewish discrimination directed towards student leaders. And AJC works to support our students at each step. To give us a view from campus and help us understand today's challenges and opportunities, we are joined by two talented young leaders who took up the mantle of leadership on their own campuses. Julia Jassy is a current student at the University of Chicago and a co-founder of Jewish on Campus. Talia Rosenberg is a recent graduate of the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you both for being with us. Thank you for having us, it's an honor. Yes, thank you. I'm so glad to have you both and let's get right into the view from campus. So each of you come from different campus environments and certainly are at different stages in your academic careers. But what you both share is your choice to create change. And that is a, a bold choice and one that um, deserves an enormous amount of credit. Um, how did you decide to get involved with Jewish activism and Israel advocacy on campus? And Talia, why don't we start with you? Thank you. Um, well, really, I came from a very strong Jewish family. Both sides of my family have always felt very passionately about our Judaism and about our connection to Israel. And additionally, I went to Jewish day school for many years. So it was something I grew up with, something that was a constant in my life that was unquestionable my support for Israel. But when I reached high school at a different school that was not a day school, I faced a lot of anti-Israel activism from close friends, friends that I had done work with on other political things before. And I felt a lot of confusion. I didn't know how to answer their questions. I didn't know the entire history dating back before 47 or from 47 to 67 or 67 to 2017. So there was a lot going on that I didn't know how to respond to. And because of that, I felt that I really needed to dig in and get the information so that I could be a proper advocate for Israel. Uh, and so by the time I got to college, that was one of my biggest goals, to learn how to be a good advocate for the state of Israel and for the Jewish people. So that's why one of the first clubs that I joined at Penn was the Penn Israel Public Affairs Committee. Uh, and additionally, another mm -hmm. club I joined later was Resetting the Table, which led dialogue within a range of the Jewish community politically and religiously about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And those are clubs that I have given a lot of my time to and I think have really helped me to be a fierce advocate for Israel and for the Jewish people at large. Mm -hmm. Julia, can you give us a sense of what your experience and what led you to, to take action? Yeah, first of all, thank you again for having me. It's it's truly an honor to be here. Um, I had a little bit of a different experience. Um, I come from Long Island, New York, which is a place where I always joke around that there are lots of Jews here, but saying that you're Jewish is like saying you play soccer. It's just a piece of you that no one really pays much mind to. Um, but I come from a family where um, Israel was very integral to our existence. Um, I, on my dad's side, I'm the family, a child of a family who lost half a generation to the Holocaust. Um, on my mom's side, I'm the child of a family of Jewish refugees to Israel who escaped ethnic cleansing in Iraq, Yemen, and Spain. So I come from a family who needed Israel to survive. Um, so this, this has always been a very personal situation for me. And I remember, you know, I never really had to confront it in high school and I came to college my first year. And my first real experience was I was in the, the busiest class um, building on campus and there was a table outside canvassing and I didn't know what it was for. There were people all around and I saw a poster that said Israel. So I walked over to the table. I thought it would be, you know, an Israel event. So um, I, I asked the guy at the table, what is this for? And I remember he said, it's it's against the occupation. And I said, what, is, what do you mean? And he said, the occupation is Israeli occupying Palestine. Um, and I remember in that moment feeling really helpless. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know how to respond. So I turned around and I walked away, I said, I'm not interested. And I remember feeling red and I remember feeling embarrassed. And I didn't know how to defend something that was so important to my family, something that was so important to myself. And I felt really ashamed of that. So I 
decided that I needed to learn how to defend it. So I started reading books and I started watching lectures and I started reading articles. Um, and that's when I got to meet other students from schools around the country um, and even around the world who were having similar experiences to me. You know, it's painted as a political issue, but Israel is more than that. It's the Jew among states. It's a scapegoat the same way that Jews are scapegoats. And when Zionism is being used as a way to mask anti-Semitism, um, I don't hate the Jews, I just hate the Zionists. It affects all of us. I mean, we're all experiencing this individually. And we decided Julia, to- I actually want to pick up exactly on that point. So yeah. thank you for raising it. Um, for, from your perspective, um, on campus today, I mean, hearing about what led you to understand what happened on campus, it's, I think a, an experience that many of our students share. Um, now that you're there and you have made that jump, and I think this is what you're getting to, yeah. can you share with us what do you think is the most persistent challenge in fighting anti-Semitism and anti-Israel sentiment on campus? And Julia, why don't you pick up there and we'll start with you and then Talia um, will turn to you. Yeah, what makes anti-Semitism this enduring hatred, the world's oldest hatred, is that it constantly changes form. It's rooted in the idea of Jew, the Jew is the ultimate scapegoat. It's 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 a really brilliant concept. You know, you have a problem in the world, you want someone to blame. You don't want to internalize that, just blame the Jews. Um, and it changes its form every generation. So this new pernicious form of anti-Semitism we're seeing, anti-Zionism, um, saying that Israel has no right to exist. I've seen people say that, you know, recently with the recent um, clash between um, Israel and Hamas in Gaza, um, people saying that there's no such thing as an Israeli citizen, that all Israelis are born inherently guilty. You see this recycled blood libel that we've been seeing since back in, you know, Middle Ages Europe that is resurfacing with a new face. Instead of hating the Jew, you hate the Zionist. And I think that's really dangerous because people who aren't Jewish, people who haven't experienced it, won't know how to recognize it. So I think the biggest threat is if we're not able to educate those around us on what anti-Semitism looks like because it's constantly changing face, we won't be able to combat it as well. So the, the first step is to clearly outline what is and what isn't anti-Semitic um, so nothing is, is lost in translation. I think that is that it's very much something that is pressing um, on campus. And like you said, I think that identification is so critical. Uh, Talia, I want to turn to you to get your perspective as well. Um, what do you think is one of one or um, two of the most persistent challenges in in fighting anti-Semitism and anti-Israel sentiment today on campus? Thank you. Well, I would definitely agree with Julia that I think the biggest problem around the world with fighting anti-Semitism is a lack of education and understanding. Um, but for me personally on my campus, I have seen the biggest challenge to fighting both anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism is just apathy. And I think that at a place like Penn, where there's a lot to focus on, you know, pre-professionalism, your classes and, and a million and 10 things that people are prioritizing, somehow fighting for your people and fighting for certain political movements just gets pushed to the bottom. And I think that that can be a very big problem when we see, you know, what we saw last month with Israel and Gaza, when students who haven't been trained to advocate are now pushed out into the real world beyond campus and are seeing this anti-Israel and anti-Semitic um, activism, and they don't know how to respond. So I think that while a huge problem on most college campuses is facing this anti-Semitism and this, this anti-Israel sentiment on campus, and I would never want to go through that, a huge problem can also just be this apathy and, and then not being prepared when the moment comes to truly defend yourself and your people. So I think while educating is really important, I also think it's important to remind people where they come from, what they stand for, and, and to remember to continue to stand for that out in the real world. Mm -hmm. That actually is a perfect segue to um, to turning to the the recent violence um, in Israel, which you both uh, touched on. Um, we have seen several student governments in in academic departments draft and circulate um, statements of solidarity with Palestinians, many of which actually include very egregious accusations of ethnic cleansing, of genocide committed by Israel. 
and have a glaring omission of the thousands of rockets that Hamas has fired, um, had fired against Israeli civilians. How are students responding um, from your perspectives when their own academic departments and student representatives who are meant to represent them and speak for them are disseminating these one-sided extremist rhetorics? Um, and what advice do you have for students who are faced with these types of bias resolutions? Uh, Julia, let us know um, from your perspective. We'll turn to you first. Yeah, I think right now students don't know how to respond. I think as a community, we've known there's been this buzzword, campus anti-Semitism. We've known it's a problem and we've kind of acknowledged it, but not done much to really confront it. And I think that we're seeing what the what the result of that is now. Um, I've definitely seen a tremendous amount of it on my campus and through Jewish on campus. I've heard about it from other schools as well. And I think there's a really big difference between advocating for Palestinians and advocating against Israelis. And that's a lot of what we're seeing. We're seeing Zionists, we're seeing Israelis, we're seeing Israel being demonized to the point where, you know, in my own personal experience, I shared a story about, you know, I have family in Tel Aviv. There was a tremendous amount of rocket fire targeting civilians in Tel Aviv. And I, I shared a story about it on my, my Instagram and somebody responded to tell me that I was being toned up for even acknowledging my own family suffering. There's, I think, a scary amount of dehumanization of Israelis, which is, you know, the first step toward a dangerous rise in anti-Semitism. Um, and so how, how do we confront that? I think the first thing that is is dangerous is if we think that being quiet is the right thing to do. And I understand and I've been in the position where everyone around you is is kind of engaging in rhetoric that is oftentimes libelous. You know, they're, they're, we've crossed the point of criticism of Israel here. We're getting into blood libel territory. You know, um, America's existed for over 200 years, has a really dangerous history of, of racism. And I've seen resolutions calling, you know, Israel, the root of that, the, 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 the state that's existed for 70 years um, the, as the root of police brutality and racism in the U.S. The resolutions that have happened at Tufts University kind of called um, deadly exchange, which which claim that, which is that that's libelous because it's, it's very clear to track the, the history of American racism. And that's kind of just one example. I think when, when oh, issues yeah. like I actually sorry, can I, I want to follow up just yeah. on, on one thing you said. Yeah. Um, for students who are being faced with that, this yeah. idea that um, certain um, ideals that we might care about, things like racism, yeah. right, that um, which are critical, which we all should should be calling out, when um, those things are being bundled with um, having an anti-Israel stance, how can students separate those and say that one actually is not you know th th this notion that both are bundled is is just totally off base um how do you address that well i think the first thing to realize is that you're not the only one who thinks that way that there's so much of not only the jewish community but the larger community that that agrees with you but we're scared to talk about it because everyone else is saying things to the contrary and we we do face backlash when, when we do speak up but the more of us that do speak up, the less this idea will be normalized. The more of us that do speak up, we can actually confront the real history and the, the true problems that America faces with racism that must be addressed in an honest um, and, and effective way. So I think that if we are vocal about the social issues in the United States that we care about, we continue to be vocal about those because they are important to us. I'm very vocal about Israel. I'm very vocal about anti-Semitism. We tell others that it's okay for them to be vocal about both of these issues as well. And that's a really important thing to spread. Thank you for that. Um, I want to turn to something actually that came up um, in, in both of your answers earlier. Um, the role that social media uh, has played in the recent um, escalation um, in Israel. So increasingly, social media provides an enormous platform for students. It allows for your perspectives to span far beyond your immediate campus, really um, to have a global impact. And with the recent escalation of Hamas-induced violence in Israel, we've seen rampant misinformation, anti-Semitism, and anti-Israel rhetoric spreading across social media to a degree that we had not previously encountered. 
Um, what role can students play in weighing in on these events? And what do you say to students who feel overwhelmed and disappointed by the content they're seeing on their feeds and may actually be afraid to jump into the fray? Um, Talia, let's start with you. Thank you. Well, I would say one thing that some people might find controversial, and I think that it is that Jewish students, first and foremost, need to look out for their own mental health. So I think that if you're seeing a lot of content online that is giving you, you know, severe anxiety, making you very upset, I think it is okay to take a step back and take a break for a few days. I think it is so, so important to stand up for what you believe in. But I also think, you know, this is happening to you. It is happening to your people. And so it is your prerogative to decide um, when to take a break and when to step up. As for when to step up, I think that social media has never and will never be the forum to have this conversation. I think that it's really, it really is an information contest. So it is so important to help disseminate that correct information about Israel and to continue to put out informative resources. But I also think a great tactic is if you see a close friend sharing something and the first thought in your mind is, how could they possibly believe this? Maybe you text them on the side and you say, hey, let's have a conversation about this. Because the truth is, speaking to someone and having a real dialogue is always going to work better than commenting on their infographic. So I think while social media can be a really powerful tool and we also need to learn how to utilize it. And I know Julia knows how to utilize it very well. And it's something that I'm very always very proud of to see what Jewish on campus posts. I think it's also important to recognize how can I really get to someone? And I think that people don't expect that when they put something on their story or on their feed, that you're gonna then go to them personally and say, let's have a talk about this. Because the truth is that friend that's posting, you know, Zionism is racism, or there should be no more deaths on the Israeli side as there are on, on, you know, on the side in Gaza. They're just doing it because it's a trend that they are hopping on because they believe it is the next social justice movement. And when you, contact them personally, that's not something they're prepared for. So I, I think that that's really the best way to handle it is, is to have those conversations and be armed with the truth. Thanks for that. And um, you alluded to it, but, um, you know, Julie, I think you have a, a unique perspective here as well as one of the co-founders of Jewish on Campus and someone who themselves is quite vocal on, on, on social media. Um, what do you have to say for um, for what's going on and and when is or is not the time to respond? Yeah, I think there are two ways of being an activist, whatever activist means. I think one way is what I do. It's, you know, I work for currently four different Jewish organizations. I um, I'm really vocal on social media. I run um, Jewish on Campus, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to um, amplifying the voices of Jewish students talking about anti-Semitism we're experiencing on campus, has a platform of almost 30,000 people, has over 1,200 story submissions. And that, that's one way to be a Jewish activist. And if you choose to, to, to be an activist in that way, I cannot implore you enough to do it with a community because doing this on your own is nothing that you should ever do. And like Talia had just mentioned, I think it's really important to you to prioritize mental health because burnout is real. Um, and you can't help your community. You can't be well within yourself. And it's really important to, to prioritize that. Something that I definitely uh, reckon with a lot myself and everyone I know in this space reckons with a lot. But the other way to be a Jewish activist and the equally as important way, I would, I would venture to say to be a Jewish activist, if not more important way, is to be a strong and vocal and proud Jewish person, is to wear your Megan David around campus, to wear your kippah, to go to Shabbat dinners, go to Hillel, go to Chabad, to not let the voices of intimidation stop you from doing what you were born to do, which is to be a loud and proud Jew. Because that's what the, I, I, I'm of the belief that you cannot be a Jewish advocate if you don't really love your Judaism as a religion, as a culture, as a history, as a people. So remembering why you're doing this, why you're fighting, because you love where you come from, where your culture is in your heart, that is, that is just as important, if not more important, than any vocal you know, online activism you can do. That is a, a beautiful point for us to end on. I want to close out this conversation um, on, on a hopeful note and looking towards the opportunities of being a Jewish student. So I have um, a question for both of you. We have a number of um, young people watching who are heading to campus, our leaders for tomorrow, 
who um, are high school students who themselves put in the work to um, build up their Jewish identity, be able to talk about Israel on campus. So as two leaders today, um, I'm gonna ask you to share with us two things. The first is what makes you hopeful about being a Jewish student today? And the second is one, what is one piece of advice you have for Jewish students who are heading to college this fall? Um, and Julia, why don't we start with you? Yeah, what makes me hopeful is this continued legacy of, of advocacy from the Jewish student perspective. I think a lot about um, the movement for Soviet Jewry, where 10,000 people were mobilized in Washington, D.C. by Jewish students advocating for the safety of the Soviet Jewish community. I think that's the legacy that we're trying to uphold, this legacy of not being quiet in the face of injustice. It's something that I hope to continue to, to be a part of. And, you know, my advice is it comes from a, a conversation I had with my rabbi um, last fall when I was kind of beginning to get involved with advocacy. I, I went to her, um, my Hillel rabbi, and I said, you know, I'm, I'm really upset. What's happening is hard. And, and someone made the joke to me recently, actually, it was, it was Jewish Heritage Month just in the past, and a lot of anti-Semitism was coming. And I was like, come on, guys, stop being anti-Semitic on Jewish Heritage Month. And they said, well, this is our heritage. Anti-Semitism is a part of our history. And my, my rabbi said to me one time, she said, our history is not just this continued cycle of persecution, it's this continued cycle of resilience. And that's what we uphold, that's what we are. We're people who have survived so much and is still here and will always still be here no matter what we have to face. And that's the legacy that we're a part of, that's the tradition that we're a part of. And it's something I'm so proud to call my history. That is great. Tali, I'm gonna to turn to you to close us out. Uh, well, first, I want to say, Julia, everything you say gives me chills. And that is part of what makes me hopeful is other students like you. And I think just the diversity of ways that one can get involved in the Jewish community on campus, whether that's religiously, politically, culturally, and within those, the million and 10 ways that you can get involved. I think that is what makes me more hopeful is that for each new day, there's a new way to be proud of your Judaism and a new way to express that. Uh, and in terms of a piece of advice going off of that, I would say, don't be afraid to explore all of your Judaism. I think, you know, some and really all sides of the political spectrum would have you put parts of yourself and your identity in a box and push it to the back of the closet. And I would say that my biggest piece of advice is to explore it all. Explore the particularism of Judaism, explore the universalism of Judaism explore the secular culture, explore the religious culture, and don't let anyone tell you what parts of your identity are are not on trend to be looking at today. So I, I would say that that's my biggest piece of advice. Well, I can speak for myself and I feel confident for all of those who are watching, you too are what make us hopeful about the Jewish future. I wanna thank both of our panelists for sharing their experiences with us today. Um, and for the leadership they bring to campus and beyond. Thank you both. To learn more about American Jewish Committee's work on campus and support our work, head to ajc.org slash youngleadership. Be sure to stay up to date as to what AJC is doing around the world by following us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at AJC Global. Thank you for joining us. Goodbye. Hello, my name is Alan Rich and I chair AJC's National Policy Commission. I'm proud to work with AJC leaders and partners across the United States to combat anti-Semitism and strengthen our shared democratic values. When I think about the major challenges our nation faces today, unfortunately, hyperpartisanship and political polarization are always top of mind. More and more Democrats and Republicans all too often seem to see each other as sworn enemies rather than as fellow Americans with competing policy visions, but at the same time, both intended to best achieve our common good. AJC understands the value, indeed the necessity of bipartisanship. And despite the prevailing winds of division, we seek to bring Republicans and Democrats together. We know that despite the often sharp rhetoric, legislators can find common ground on the issues that matter to all of us as Americans 
as well as those issues of special importance to Jewish Americans, including combating anti-Semitism and supporting the critical US-Israel relationship. Over the past several years, AJC has inspired the creation of several bipartisan congressional caucuses, including the Bipartisan Task Force on Combating Anti-Semitism, the Congressional Caucus on Black-Jewish Relations, the Congressional Hellenic Israel Alliance, and the Latino Jewish Congressional Caucus. These caucuses give legislators from both parties the opportunity to reach across partisan lines to tackle shared concerns. Along with our intergroup partners, we've championed legislation ranging from that which addresses rising hate crime to protecting religious institutions. And we pride ourselves in keeping support for Israel where it should be, bipartisan. Remaining bipartisan is not always easy. And our approach certainly has its critics on both sides of the political divide. But at AJC, we know that finding common ground doesn't have to mean sacrificing our principles or our values. Rather, it means envisioning a future where we as a nation come together to tackle tough issues and solve big problems. It means treating one another with respect and dignity and putting our country first. In other words, it means reimagining what's possible. AJC has always been serious about our nonpartisanship, but it must be said that in recent years, bipartisanship has shifted from being a footnote to a modus operandi, a real guiding principle for our organization. Its primacy doesn't make it any easier for us. And I imagine that for you all as members of Congress, it's even more complicated. It's our hope that in this conversation, we can get down to the brass tacks, just how bad is partisanship in Congress today? Look at intra-party tensions vis-a-vis -vis the struggle for bipartisanship. Look for bright spots, the issues that are still bringing Democrats and Republicans together across the board. And finally, glean from your wisdom about how AJC can be a force for unity, bringing diverse factions together for the common good. We'll dive right in. While it may feel like ancient history to some viewers, I know the insurrection of January 6th is still at the forefront of the minds of many members of Congress. To what degree is the partisan tension around that event and the adjacent issues, talking about the vote to certify the elections, to impeach the president, et cetera, still playing out in Congress? Uh, Congressman Bacon, I'd like to start with you. It has exacerbated inter-party tensions and intra-party uh, relations. We see a lot more confrontations on the floor right now. Uh, there's uh, some on the Democrat side that don't want to work with Republicans if they voted to object. Uh, to the point where some won't even get in the same elevator uh, with, with folks, and that's unfortunate. Uh, but I also see it within our party. Uh, there is anger towards those who certified. Uh, there's anger towards those who voted for the commission. Um, and so I see it uh, within the party and, uh, but also working with each other. But there's rays of hope. Uh, the rays of hope is we have 58 Republicans and Democrats working together on problem solvers. We have 26 Republicans and Democrats working at four country caucus, all veterans. And that's really the core that we can build from uh, so we can regain civility and cohesion and some teamwork. Congressman Bacon, I wanna ask you a question about the past few weeks. Um, the Jewish community has been watching with a lot of um, concern, the conflict in Israel and then a terrifying spike in anti-Semitism. Uh, giving credit where it's due, Republicans have turned out almost universally statements of support, and we really appreciate it. But at the same time, on the House floor, Israel was used several times in partisan procedural maneuvers, presumably to allow Republicans to avoid taking votes they didn't want to take or to make Democrats take votes that would make them look bad. Um, both parties have used these tactics before. I'm not asking in sort of... Um, a, one-sided way, um, but the fact that these kind of procedures can be used um, and are being used to politicize really fundamental issues, uh, 
is concerning. What do we do about that in the long term? How do we make sure that supporting Israel and supporting Jews doesn't become a more partisan issue than, than they already are? Well, first, Julie, supporting Israel should be a bipartisan issue uh, on both sides. If it's not, uh, the country of Israel and its existence will be harmed. So we want to make this Republican and a Democrat uh, issue. And to the voting things that have been going on on the floor, you know, the minority only has one way of trying to insert its agenda, and that's through motions to recommit. And we know that there's a, a large support uh, on the Democrat side also for Israel, at least with, with at least half the party. And uh, so this is our one way of trying to get our agenda in there, because otherwise we, we've been, you get shut out of the process. And both parties have done it, like you say. Uh, but I do think there's a concern of, we don't want, we don't want this to be a Republican pro-Israel, Democrat anti-Israel, because that's not good for the existence and the future and the security of Israel. So I, I agree with you there. Thank you. Congresswoman, I know you've sort of felt this personally. Can you tell us a little bit about your experiences in the past few weeks with regards to, to votes of, on Israel? Certainly. Well, you know, I think that um, I've, I'll go back to really the first time I spoke on the floor of the House as a member of Congress, and I never expected that the first time that I speak as a representative would be to stand up to anti-Semitism, to stand up to claims of dual loyalty from someone in my very own party, um, and then fast forward to this year to stand up on the floor of the House with my colleagues in strong support of Israel, to say things like Israel has a right to exist, Israel has a right to defend itself, Hamas is a terrorist organization, those things that are such basic and fundamental facts and beliefs and tenets um, that I think, like Don said, are, are bipartisan and that our support for Israel has always been and should continue to be very strong. We should not be conditioning aid. We should not be using um, dangerous and, and divisive language that's leading to anti-Semitism and spikes in those types of events in our country. Um, and so, um, you know, this week, uh, some tactics that are used for political purposes um, were used to call out Democrats, Democrats who have been very staunch supporters of Israel. Um, I would say that the Republican Party um, did this in a very deliberate way, and they're using paid advertising against me um, to say that I voted uh, against supporting Israel and support for the Iron Dome, which is absurd. It's ridiculous and it's a lie. Um, they did that twice this week, both with a motion um, that was procedural with concerns to supporting Israel with Iron Dome. And they also did it earlier in the week uh, relative uh, to a measure that would condemn um, uh, and sanction Hamas, uh, which I voted for and supported in the last Congress and would do so again. Uh, but the intertwining of these is issues uh, concerning the support of Israel, um, I think is destructive. I think that we need to show a strong unified front that this is a bipartisan issue that the US Congress strongly supports um, Israel and the US Israel relationship and providing the security assistance for Israel as outlined in the MOU. Um, so, you know, I would would ask uh, Don to speak more forcefully with his leadership to say that, you know, we can disagree on policy issues. You can attack me on all kinds of stuff, um, but, you know, please don't make Israel um, the, the weapon that you use for that, because I think it is counterproductive to what Don and I are working very hard on, which is to support the U.S. Israel relationship. And we, all of us at AJC, truly thank both of you for that support um, when it's easy and especially when it's hard. Uh, th this conversation, I think, is leading to a really interesting place because bipartisanship is hard, but it also sort of assumes that the parties themselves are operating together or with joint purpose. And at this particular moment in time, I'm not totally sure that is true for either party. Um, Congresswoman, I'll stay with you for just one second um, because you talked about your first floor speech. Um, and because uh, Congressman Bacon said, you know, 50% of Democrats support Israel. Um, there are concerns about the Israel positions held by several Democrats. Um, how worried should our viewers be about their role, their prominence in the party? What does it portend for the future of support for Israel within the Democratic Party? I'm concerned that, that they get so much attention because they truly do not represent the majority of Democrats or the majority of members of the U.S. Congress. Um, and, you know, I work very hard, um, work very hard with my colleagues in the Democratic Caucus who are strong supporters of Israel um, to reiterate the fact that, you know, our support for Israel is, is strong, it's unwavering. We do not support conditioning aid. We support Israel's right to defend itself. We support the security assistance um, and 
the fact that um, these voices have risen both within Congress and in the wider public and on social media, you know, I, I find it very troubling. And I think that all of us who are strong supporters of the U.S.'s relationship have that much more, more work to do. It doesn't matter if they're coming from a particular political party or a particular public figure, but just in broadly in general um, to you know, set the narrative straight um, uh, about Israel and that Hamas is a terrorist organization, that Israel has a right to defend itself. Um, and you know, it's just a, a lot more work for those of us who are out, for, out there advocating for these positions. Thank you. Congressman Bacon, I want to ask you also about intra-party dynamics. In the post-Trump era, many are saying that the Republican Party is experiencing an identity crisis. Um, some who hold the sort of traditional line of the party, and it seems uh, an increasing number who will tip a hat to more radical elements. That's perhaps best represented by Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene, who has repeatedly made inexcusable and inflammatory statements. Is the Republican Party still one grand old party or have the political pressures become simply too great? Um, which Republicans are representing the party? There surely are divides in our party as well. I, I do want to respond to one thing to Elaine and I respect her comments, uh, but I have the same problem with her party accusing me of being pro-QAnon. And yet I voted to certify, I voted for the commission. So we have, so there's this partisan lines that both parties use and, and it, it and it does divide us and it's, it's not, not necessary. And our party, we're, there's a bit of a debate. Are we a party of values and ideas, which I believe in, I'm the party of Lincoln, or are we more of a party of like 100% supporting the President Trump? And uh, many of us would say, I, I agree with a lot of the policies of the president. I don't agree necessarily with the name calling and the Twitter and, and things like that. So there's a divide in our party there. And when it comes to Marjorie Taylor Greene, I condemned her comments. I think I was the first one or second or third, somewhere in there on CNN the other day. And then a lot of fo folks followed, uh, but they were reprehensible comments. And unfortunately, it takes away uh, from the focus that we should be having on the actual physical violence being done towards Jewish Americans in New York and our big cities. To me, that's a bigger problem right now. And we should, but by her comments, it sort of took away that focus of what I think is even a larger issue right now. Um, and we all, all of us, Republican, Democrats, should just Make it clear, we are anti, we oppose, we find anti-Semitism repugnant. I got also throw out there, uh, Julie, I get attacked for quote being anti-Semitic every day. And on the Republican side of the aisle, that is a standard target by, I would say more partisans on the Democratic party. And so there is a thin skin on our side right now on this whole issue, because I've been targeted for four years as that, and I am not. I love Israel, I love the Jewish people. And I have, it's one of my, things I focus on most. And so what we saw this last two weeks to me was more of a unveiling of, see anti-Semitism is not just found with white nationalists. We got other, it comes from multiple sources. And we should just say, I don't care if it comes from the right. I don't care if it comes from the left. It's repugnant. We denounce it, we hate it. And uh, we should stand united against it. But unfortunately we're making it into a political attack against each other. and it, and really, that, that, that hurts our country, I, I think. It divides us in an area that we should be unified. Yeah, no, I, I'd like to jump in and just say, Don, I agree with you completely. Um, I think that um, just as some of the other issues we've mentioned during this conversation, they're issues that should not be used, um, you know, as as political tools or weapons uh, against people and that we need to be strongly united on these. And, you know, I want to point out something that I really admire that Don did last year as a member of the Armed Services Committee. Um, you know, there was a lot of discussion and this was really difficult in the last administration to stand up and say this is wrong. But uh, when we talked about renaming bases and bases that were named um, after former Confederate officers, I mean, Don led that charge with Congressman Anthony Brown from Maryland. Um, and, you know, I think that Don has frequently, you know, been uh, a lone voice on some issues. And I, I definitely admire his leadership on that and, and many other things. So, um, you know, thank you, Don. I echo that, thanks. Um, it's one of the, the tough issues that as we are talking about bipartisanship with two members who really epitomize um, crossing the party lines to get things done, um, 
it, it really shows what a problem it is that both of you have experienced these types of attacks and not, you know, over the course of decades, but recently um, and in a way that is that is still being felt um, for you. So um, it, it, one, it leads me to the next question. And it's a little bit about what we do in Congress, but it's mostly about what we sort of on the outside can do. Um, both of you have spoken about your military experience being this key factor leading to your ability to successfully reach across the aisle. First, thank you for your service to our nation. We can't make military service a prerequisite to serving in Congress, but are there lessons? Are there transferable skills that A, Congress should absorb, and B, a bipartisan advocacy organization like AJC can promote and try to push out? Um, Congressman Laurie, I'll start with you. Well, um, as I alluded to earlier, I think, you know, service in the military is something that's very nonpartisan and very nonpolitical. Um, and, you know, as an example, it was kind of a joke when I, that came up a few times when I first ran, like I actually voted for the person in 2016 who I ran against in 2018. It kind of show you, um, you know, the, the lack of partisanship in my, my background. Um, but I truly believe that, you know, I stood in a different place on some of the, the issues and um, could represent our district uh, more effectively. But, you know, I think that idea of, you know, a shared common background um, and when, you know, folks like Don and I come together on the Armed Services Committee, I mean, we, we live this, he in the Air Force, I in the Navy, that, you know, one of the key purposes of Congress is to, you know, our national defense and defending our country. And, you know, it is not difficult to come together on those particular issues. But I would say that even on those issues, I don't stand with the majority of the people in my party. Um, and I find that, you know, quite challenging sometimes because, you know, I certainly think that we need to be spending uh, more on defense, we need to be investing more in our Navy and, you know, our future defense forces um, because of, you know, what our threats are in the future. You know, if we do go to war in the Pacific, if something happens with China, it is a naval and air fight. So the Navy and the Air Force are really um, the, the ones that we need to be, be focusing on and providing those resources. So, you know, although I saw a sigh of relief when the preliminary numbers for the defense budget came out that there were not significant cuts proposed, you know, I, and I assume Don feels very similar, but, you know, I think we need to see like three to 5% real growth in the defense budget to meet the challenges that we have today. So, um, you know, maybe we both find ourselves in similar situations, people who are pragmatic with, uh, you know, the kind of backgrounds that we have in the military, um, find that we don't always stand with, uh, our own party sometimes as much as maybe we find these, these tensions across the aisle. General. Thank you. Uh, the military has taught me to be a problem solver. And I think that's where Elaine is at uh, and our veterans on both sides of the aisle. Uh, I see myself as a man of faith first, a family man, an American before I'm a Republican. And I, and I think the military ingrains that, those prior, that prioritization uh, in our lives. So when I'm serving in the Congress, I don't want to focus on where I disagree with Elaine or, or anybody else. I want to focus on what can we agree on and how can we get a 60 or 70 percent agreement and move and move from that point. And that's been my approach. That's why I'm on the problem solvers. That's why I'm on the four country caucus, which is a, a group of 20, 25 veterans or 26 veterans now of half Republican, half Democrat, and just trying to work together. And so I think the Armed Services Committee is the most bipartisan committee that at least I've been a part of, because we are trying to solve problems, we're trying to find agreements. And about 95% of what we do in the HASC for armed services is bipartisan. And, uh, and I enjoy that much better than these, uh, some of these other committees where it's uh, a, a big food fight every day. Uh, but we're about solving problems, Elaine and I, and trying to find areas of agreement. Yeah, and I'll just jump in too, um, you know, because Don and I both serve on both the bipartisan caucuses. He mentioned the problem solvers and the four country caucus. And, you know, I think when people turn on the national news and they see the headlines on, on TV today, they think that there aren't people out there working together. But when I tell you that the problem solvers caucus is a caucus of 58 members of Congress, equal number of Democrats and Republicans who come together multiple times a week, uh, establish um, working groups, uh, very focused on solving problems and finding common ground and bringing those to legislative solutions. Um, you know, the last COVID release packet, relief package in the prior administration was a result of the Problem Solvers Caucus working in hand in hand with a bipartisan group of senators to get that across the line. And that that's the kind of thing you can do um, when you work together on a bipartisan basis. So if there's one takeaway for people, it's, you know, it's not like um, one sees on TV.
TV with everyone at each other's throats or, you know, spats that happen in hallways of the Capitol. I mean, the truth is, is, you know, sometimes at eight o'clock in the morning, we're sitting around a table with some half warm coffee and some half stale donuts <laughs> trying to figure out how to solve infrastructure. Um, and, you know, that is really a priority for, for people like us who, you know, seek out these opportunities to work in a bipartisan way. That's really beautiful. Um, and I'm glad that um, this, the spats that we were talking about before are also, um, you know, uh, that's not the only thing that's happening, that the, that the cold coffee and the stale, and the stale <laughs> pastries are also helping to, to facilitate bipartisanship. I'm not letting either of you off the hook, though, on the second part of my question about what a, a bipartisan advocacy organization like AJC can do. Um, to help foster greater bipartisanship at a time that that is difficult. Um, I'll Carlos jump in. I think what you're here. doing right here is very helpful. You're putting uh, two uh, similarly minded uh, folks, so one Republican, one Democrat together. Uh, and I think that this helps, you know, uh, the 58 Republicans and Democrats and the problem solvers, if the Congress was more like that 58, we would get a lot done. I just wish the problem solvers, we could have more impact and moderate uh, the, whatever majority party is in power, because uh, we could get a lot more done, a lot more passed through the Senate uh, if we could. So I think having your attention on those who are problem solvers or who are for country first uh, does that. Because right today, most of the attention does get put on uh, the extremes of both of our parties and who love to fight, uh, who love to make it a, a fist fight wherever they can, because that gives them more clicks on social media, more, more media attention. Uh, but those folks literally don't get anything done in Congress. They're not the ones passing any legislation. They're not finding any agreements. It's the folks that, it's the Elaines and the Don Bacons of the world working the problem solvers that are uh, actually getting things done and trying to find a consensus. Congresswoman, do you have any additional wisdom? Well, you know, I would say for an advocacy group like AJC, first of all, thank you uh, for being such strong advocates um, and, you know, reaching out to those of us in Congress, make sure that we hear from you. And I think that it is very important um, to, you know, try to reach people from a variety of perspectives. Um, you know, if you're advocating on an issue, you know, find who you think might be the most challenging person to convince of your viewpoint, or at least have them, you know, learn something that can help inform their decisions down the road. So, you know, I would say that, you know, if you have an advocacy uh, meeting or phone call or send a letter and, you know, you're not satisfied with the response uh, from that particular member, um, don't give up. Um, you know, I think that the more they hear from people, the more they hear different perspectives than maybe what their, you know, current thought process is. Um, you know, the more likely there be to be receptive in, in the future and to try to, you know, work together or at least find some common ground where they can work, work together on these issues. Thank you both for that wisdom. Um, we are always trying to be smarter, more effective, um, better advocates for the state of Israel, for combating anti-Semitism, for promoting pluralism. Um, and, and that wisdom can really help guide us. Um, you are both models of reaching across the aisle, um, of getting work done, as opposed to just making um, either Twitter or real life battles. Um, and we truly appreciate everything that you've done for the Jewish people and for, for the sake of bringing America together, restoring our country, um, improving the, the partisanship that invades so many of our, our lives and the issues that are important to us. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.